So while we're waiting, uh, I, I'll just ask some uh, not part of the formal panel questions. Uh, and you guys can feel free not to answer. Um, so for all three of you, uh, what was your strategy, if any, for the Bitcoin halving? Was it priced in, not priced in, up, down? Um, let me see, I need to unmute. Uh, let's go with uh, Joe first. Yeah, just not touching it with a 10 foot pole for myself personally. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm I'm definitely uh, I'm not a fan of uh, personally day trading. Uh, although the guy, uh, some of the guys do, but uh, I'm I'm not uh, one that likes to do that. <laughs> and I'm and you know honestly, it's it's really crazy the way you can just go up and down. The speculation is insane. Yeah, I had a couple uh, questions from uh, the audience early on about what was the strategy. Uh, you know, up down, uh, which crypto to go in. Um, but yeah, that's not going to be part of the formal panel. Um, but yeah, while we're waiting, um, Aaron, do you mind sharing? Yep. So I'm with Job on this one. Uh, I don't know how to day trade. I don't know how to chart. So <laughs> I'm, I'm the guy who buy and hold. And I think over a long period of time, you should be fine. Uh, of course, granted, I also like sometimes... Okay, la, I feel like it's a bit too expensive. I, I set a lower price and then wait for it to drop. So, but I don't think I, I have any, I don't think I'll be able to give any like predictions on price estimates or anything. Uh, although, um, we've, I mean, we've kind of started, if you're a Luno customer, we've kind of started uh, sharing Market Insight newsletter. In the newsletter, it goes out every week. So, as long as you made a recent transaction, you should be getting that. So, that might be, a lot more in, uh, informative than my own strategy. <laughs> All right, and um, QI, I'm gonna unmute you now. QI, oh, okay, thanks. So, um, uh, personally, I normally I have a portfolio. Uh, I, I do dollar cost average also. Means that over, you know, every week or consistently, I will, I will buy you know, as, uh, as a class like Bitcoin. I don't really care about prices, but uh, you know, we also be looking into more uh, technical analysis to trade crypto uh, on, on, on different portfolio. So, uh, the idea, but, uh, but I think, you know, giving fair share, um, our team also do some daily analysis. So, if you go to our Facebook page, Tonight's Malaysia, you will see in a daily basis we, we share. Uh, certain financial outlook and also digital asset pricing. Uh, if you, if you are a trader, you can you can go over to like our page. It's free since it's free. Then you can have insight day to day basis. Uh, apparently, uh, every week we also have we have at least one webinar uh, to share about financial outlook and some strategy uh, like scalping uh, or you know arbitrage strategies. So if those who are interested can can feel free you know to join the webinar. It is free. Uh, hopefully from there you can benefit. You know, and it opens certain insights uh, for, for you. Yep. All right, so I think uh, this is going to continue on with the uh, earlier conversation. Uh, but since we mentioned uh, Bitcoin halving, uh, did you see any uh, trends in your own um, experience on your own exchanges? Uh, how were the market responding? And if I extend it a bit longer uh, from the start of the uh, MCO, and with, uh, for example, in the US, uh, money printer Gober, um, did you see any uh, certain trends in your um, in your exchanges? And let's go with uh, QI first. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. I think uh, long term, I'm very bullish. Uh, I'm 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 not a fan of uh, you know price prediction. So um, I, I don't think the market will care what I say, share. But long term wise, uh, I'm very bullish to Bitcoin and also you know few established um, digital asset. Um, the idea is that I feel that we are still at a very early stage and uh, with a lot of asset class you know undergo quantitative uh, sovereign you know doing the quantitative easing. Uh, asset classes like Bitcoin which undergo quantitative hardening, which you know we encounter the reason having. Uh, definitely, there are a lot of uh, factors to be bullish about, and the key thing still we are at a very early stage. There are more audience that we can convert. I think the step 
to look into the population, we are looking less than 1% uh, who are in this crypto community or no digital community. And when the numbers grow to 5%, 10%, I believe the market cap will follow also, right? And to put into perspective also, uh, it's not as you know, 10 US um, company. So in the potential side, I think there are you know, a lot of space that uh, the digital asset like Bitcoin can, uh, that, that's the idea. So long, long run, I'm very, very bullish. Yeah. And Job? And Job? Yeah, so uh, on the exchange, not so much, uh, but I think uh, definitely as the halving came close, you'd get, you'd get a lot of uh, interest. Uh, and, and, you know, being in the space, you just get a lot of pings, uh, not just myself, but the team as well, right? You get a lot of folks uh, from the outside pinging us and saying, uh, suddenly, hey, what is Bitcoin and how do I get in and how many percentage can I get every month and stupid things like that coming up just because, you know, it's been in the news and it's become popular. Um, I don't think uh, at the moment, uh, I would say that uh, due to the halving, I'm not going to speculate <laughs> on whether it's going, uh, which way it's going to go. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, as far as enthusiasm is concerned, usually same as the last halving, right? When it's all over the news, someone would come in and, and start asking. Um, not so much on the exchange, no. And Aaron and Luna? Sorry, uh, sorry, Aaron, I need to unmute you quick. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah go ahead. I couldn't unmute myself. So, um, interestingly for us, um, at the start of the MCO, I guess when you saw again, around mid-March, when all the global markets crashed. So there was a lot of uh, selling activity in uh, Luno as well. I think in line with everything, uh, there, there was a lot of selling. Um, and then during the MCO period itself, uh, it, wasn't as, it wasn't as huge as we might have expected because I think like some people have seen that, you know, Rakuten trade sign up like 10,000 new customers or something like that. Uh, because I think a lot of people were at home trading. So we were expecting a, a lot of interest. It, there was some interest, but not, not crazy interest. Uh, but towards the end of the MCO, um, especially as we approach near the halving, uh, now we're seeing quite record levels of uh, trading and also interest signing up. So it's quite, uh, quite busy times for us. Lah. So um, we are act actually, we are a little bit struggling with the number of signups right now. So if you've got any friends who are asking why, because uh, we're dealing with massive queues. So we're trying to get through it as soon as possible. But yeah, you can tell your friends that we're very sorry because we can't uh, deal with it right now. Trying our best though. So. Maybe you can get the community to volunteer um, doing KYC for you. Um, we had a, since we're on the topic, we had a question from uh, Yi Kyung, uh, one of the uh, members earlier, on what's the typical uh, age range and occupation of your users? And I guess, make it general, uh, what's your typical user profile? Uh, and I'll go with Joe first. Yeah, okay. So for us, um, I would say uh, mid 20s to early 30s, um, and uh, we see a lot more arbitrage traders usually on our uh, system. Uh, we got a good mix of uh, you know folks mostly from urban areas, but uh, we also do see like uh, East Coast traders come in a fair bit uh, on and off. But yeah, so quite a good mix in general. And uh, QY. And, uh, QY. Yeah, um, I think uh, roughly we are the uh, you know we, we have the same stats uh, mid of twenty um, to you know forty forty plus. We see in Malaysia, we see uh, those who are in their fifty. Um, yeah, they are, they are very active in in, in, the, in the digital asset scene also. Yeah. All right, and um, all right, and um, you know. For us, it's pretty similar as well. The 25 to 34 is the first primary range and then the 35 to 44, I think, is the second most common one. 
So basically your millennials and your Gen X, uh, interestingly, majority men. So for all, I see all the names in this chat also men. So, you know, do what you have to do. Lah. Invite your girlfriends, invite your wives to trade. Because pre predominantly it's still men right now. Um, I, I think I saw a couple uh, females, uh, at least in the uh, RSVPs. Um, if you don't mind sharing and if you want to uh, defend your gender, please feel free to put it in the chat. Otherwise, yeah, what Aaron said is probably correct. Um, anyway, so uh, now that it's been a month plus uh, since we had our lockdown or movement restrictions, can you share some of your uh, challenges or strategies in dealing with the um, working remote? Uh, we can go with Aaron. It's actually been super hard. Uh, we've been on full working remotely since uh, this, slightly before the MCO. We preemptively did it. So we've all been stuck at home for like seven weeks now. Uh, it's hard because we find ourselves working more, more than usual. Because for the simple reason that it takes, even the simplest thing can take so much more effort to do. Like, like last time you can walk over to your colleague's table and just sort it out within 30 seconds right now. You have to set up a chat, you set up a call. So it's been super hard. Uh, I think everyone's dealing with uh, how to seg seg segregate work with uh, life. Uh, I think what's helped us is we try to uh, work on routines. So at a certain time, we, we have our wind down routine. So at a certain point of time, we'll have a meet up to just talk about casual stuff and end the work week. Uh, that's been the adjustment that we've made. Otherwise, it's really hard for us actually. And uh, in Luno's case as well, since you have uh, international branches, um, how has that been managed? Yeah, so we are overseas in all the markets that we are in and all our offices. We are also on fully remote working because yeah, I guess COVID is everywhere. Um, so it's pretty much similar. Uh, and then we have, our, our HR team has been pretty proactive. Plus. So they've been sharing tips on how to work from home, tips on mental health, which may seem a bit over. But I think after multiple weeks of like, trying to separate between work and life, then you start to realize, yeah, actually mentally I'm starting to get a little bit strained. Um, so yeah, that, that has been very helpful from the HR team. Um, I think uh, this hasn't been really the case for me, but I know of people who've been stuck at home by themselves uh, mm. and a month uh, long being stuck, I, I guess it's kind of, it's essentially solitary confinement. So yeah, um, not fun uh, to be in that. Uh, position. Uh, can I get uh, Job to share your story? Sure. Yeah, so um, yeah, similar to, to uh, Aaron, right, we also triggered our work from home uh, prior to the MCO going off. Uh, to be honest, the moment Penang had our first case, we started to go, yeah, you know, let's uh, pack it up and, uh, you know, just operate remotely. Um, but what, what that ended up meaning was that our final uh, review with the SC and our go live actually happened during the MCO as well. So not only was it running operations from home, it was deployment. Uh, so that really made things quite interesting. Um, but that being said, uh, you know, uh, we did, we did uh, manage to come together. Um, in my prior life, I, I did um, majority of my work from home as well. So I did have a good experience in managing teams remotely. Um, so that, I guess it, it does help to, to coordinate, but all in all, it was a you know, massive team effort for everybody to get together and uh, be able to figure out who needs to do what and make sure we're not stepping on each other's toes, doing double work, stuff like that. Um, yeah, it, it, it rolled out really well and I, I thought you know, we did a great job. Um, as with many new companies, though, most of our systems are already designed to be online. Uh, we did factor in that uh, remote management is required. So switching to remote all in all was not as difficult. Mainly the deployment through a bit of a monkey wrench in our, you know, our planning. But, you know, it was good learning and, and it went out smoothly. And an interesting thought on, uh, on, the, on how COVID is hitting us, right? Um, they are traditional for us. We are young companies, and and we could adapt to this uh, work from home quickly. But if you think about all those older companies, 
large corporations that have thousands of folks. Um, I know that many of them were playing around with the idea of having partial work from home or full work from home staff, but none of them actually invested the cost into enabling the work from home. Right? You, you have set up your VPNs and your um, secure hardware and things like that to work remotely. And, uh, you know, it was just never a priority, but COVID somehow forced this, uh, you know, expense uh, in, into these companies. And now that they've sunk this cost, I would think that a number of them are probably discovering that certain functions of the office can actually work well uh, remotely and they save, you know, footprint costs on sites and things. So after the restrictions are lifted, I still feel that a lot of uh, companies especially those big ones with thousands of employees, a substantial portion of them might you know, maintain this work from home uh, method since the cost is sunk. And, you know, it's going to change, uh, have knock-on effects on little things like transportation, fuel consumption, home deliveries, and things like that. So yeah, this, this uh, COVID thing really did shake things up a little bit. I think we're going to see some changes in how um, traditional and uh, modern offices work after this. Maybe no more offices. No, not no more. You know, you, you can't, you can't, you can't do an operation. You can't build a computer from your hall, right, uh, for mass production. So you know, certain roles. I, I think um, you know, everyone has looked at it as a, as a, as it's, it's sort of a social experiment, really. Um, that most people thought telecommuting was going to be a thing. It's just that you have to spend money and and figure out if it's for your company or not. And COVID is just forcing it, and uh, you know, might have a knock-on effect. It'll be interesting to see. Right, and QY, I'm going to wait for a bit before I end with you. Um, yeah, but um, maybe one thing we, we are quite lucky is uh, um, before, you know, um, everyone had to, before MC1, uh, we managed to do quite a lot of time together. Uh, Especially, you know, me and my KL, you know, Malaysia team, we have a chance to gather together. We almost have cancer and they, they, I think it, it pretty much prepare us, you know, when, when we have to force to work from home. Of course, as a tech company, I think, um, you know, we, we are always ready to, to work no matter where we are. Um, and at the same time, uh, the Malaysia team also to manage a team in Vietnam, Singapore, and also Thailand. So pretty much, we are already there, you know, um, through all the communication channels like Slack, we are always, you know, able to communicate, communicate whether, whether I'm with the team or not. But it still made a difference, um, you know, um, when totally, you know, we, we just have to communicate online. There's no physical presence right now. I think we go through this almost two months plus. Um, it's a really, very fresh experience. Um, in fact, on our BCP, we don't even have this consideration. We thought the worst case, you know, we need to prepare is just street operation. And I think this COVID thing really teach a lot of business owner um, and really accelerate their business. Like who, who, who can imagine, right, last time we thought office space is necessary, but this COVID just proved that, you know, if you still stick with office space, then your business just can't run. Like you have to pivot, you have to improve. And this definitely will impact because a lot of business owner now will start to think, if my employee, you know, thousands of my employees can work from home, um, what, is, what, what is the point of having an office space, right? Um, a lot of mindset, I think, will be changed. Um, even how you operate the business also will change, right? So I, I think that's the interesting part. All right. Um, so to go back into uh, regulation side of the story, um, I saw um, Synergy was uh, covered uh, yesterday in the by FinTech Malaysia, and um, the team said that you're interested in in looking into doing IEOs, so initial exchange offerings. Uh, so Job, can you share uh, your thoughts on the general regulation around IEOs and the general market, and then what your company's uh, plans are for that? To find your name to unmute you. Okay. You should be good. All right, we're good. Yeah, so, yeah. This this mute on mute thing is confusing. <laughs> uh, so yeah, uh, we we're optimistic uh, on the enthusiasm that uh, the IEO space can bring. Uh, we're looking forward to when the SC drops the final framework out. 
which we do expect is sometime later this year. And we are interested in participating in this space, but not so much, you know, where we're interested in providing the technology side of it. Um, I don't, uh, it's, it's going to be an interesting space, but we really do want to see what the final framework is going to be like before we actually lay out the actual uh, plans that we're going to uh, participate in the IEO space. Um, as far as we're concerned though, this, if the IEO does come by uh, and it is uh, welcoming to the development, you know, it's, it's, going to, it's going to encourage a lot of uh, development in our space. And I think the things like the DeFi space, uh, if it drops, uh, we can actually see uh, encouragement for local local uh, folks to start uh, listing in this in this area, and uh, you know anything to do with improved enthusiasm around uh, blockchain uh, industry is going to be good for business for us. So for for all three of us, uh, you know, in the uh, the exchanges here. As for the actual strategy, I think I'm going to hold out until we get the actual uh, framework on the table. <laughs> yeah. As an as an observer, like uh, you never really hear about. Um, I mean, the ICO hype has died down, and IEOs, I, I guess, do happen, but it's not as in the spotlight anymore. Um, so mm. I'm wondering if, especially as a Malaysian um, uh, exchange or a Malaysian branch of an exchange, whether uh, there is enough of a market of people who want to uh, fundraise using IEOs. I think it's the other way around. I think when the IEO drops and the projects hit the table, it will build that market. Um, you know, it's, it's going to be a fantastic bridge for many people to start seeing the use of blockchains outside of just being digital money. And, uh, you know, from that alone, we can sort of use it as a platform to bring people in, into understanding what the big deal of it is, right? Um, so I think that market will be generated by the uh, development we see in this space not so much as this space looking for, for money in, uh, to be developed. Okay, and um, Aaron and QI, if you uh, want to chip in on uh, IEOs as well, I'd uh, love to hear your thoughts. Um, yeah, QI, maybe you go first. I, I saw Aaron chase place with you. <laughs> uh, I think uh, pretty much it all back in Singapore we launched. Uh, because uh, Singapore framework is a bit different, um, they are using a few different format of tokens uh, where we can actually run our IO there. Um, so, sorry. Okay, yeah, sorry. Me. So I think, um, me, me. yeah, but, but, but back in Malaysia, I think the format is very different because we're looking at the securities. So it will be totally new experience for us and definitely we are looking forward for partners who are keen, you know, on this IEO. Uh, and then we will see how we're going to pursue IEO. Uh, although technically to implement this, you know, uh, we can leverage our past experience. But yeah, in Malaysia, we just look forward for having a right strategy partners and we will see how, how we will. Uh, we first on, you know, uh, uh, you know, the first. And I think uh, on on digital asset side, you know, there are still a lot of misconceptions, uh, a lot of groundwork we have to do. Uh, second, also, you know, to, to create brand awareness. Uh, who, who, who is yeah. I think pretty much this will keep us occupied this year. Yeah. We've been finding a lot of uh, interest. From, so a lot of people have been approaching us, um, even without the final guidelines from the S. I mean, there's guidelines, but there's no application yet, right? We don't know how to submit the application or when. But I think the, the general interest in the, the market uh, is very positive. Uh, and these are small companies, tech companies. They are large conglomerates who want to fundraise using digital tokens because they think there are advantages. So I think the, the IEO market is, is big here, definitely. Um, I was looking at some, some stats on, uh, if we look at equity crowdfunding or P2P, we think that the market for IEO will be at least that of the equity crowdfunding, which is potentially at least uh, tens of millions of ringgit a year, if not hundreds of millions of ringgit. 
So in terms of the actual strategy as to whether we'll do it ourselves, whether we'll partner, I think we are similar to the others. Uh, we really need to see what it entails before we, we make the decision on how we want to do the IEO thing. But I think overall market sentiment is very positive. Uh, and I guess now, now that you mentioned it, uh, Pitch In I think announced last month that they uh, want to try do IEOs as well. Uh, do mm -hmm. you think, how easy do you think it, it is for a non-crypto company to suddenly start doing um, something like an IEO? I think, uh, well, I mean, there's a lot of blockchain developers in the space now. I mean, if you say five years ago, probably it's going to be very challenging. I think there's lots of uh, blockchain developers in the market now. So probably technical expertise is, is, is already there to be hired or to be built. But I think the, the challenge would be um, not so much on just the technical side, but running a digital asset business, which I think is a little bit different from just the pure technical side of things. So I, um, yeah, I think that will be the, the challenge really, the digital asset side of the business. All right, so um, while well, still on regulation, um, we had a couple of questions actually from uh, the meetup members, even before the uh, talk started, specifically on tax. So the first question, which um, I guess is an obvious answer, but we should let uh, all three of you answer is, uh, uh, are transaction information being actively shared with LHDN? Um, so, a uh, quick answer from all three of you. Yeah, we don't share directly to LHDN, no. Uh, when you say directly, so is there an indirect way that you're sharing? No, we only, uh, we only have uh, the information. If it's not, uh, at the moment, if it is not uh, something that is, uh, you know, uh, tied in with, the, with any, I would say, dodgy situations, Right. Um, there's no plans to actually just share out any information. So yeah, you know, leave it at that. Yeah. <laughs> so definitely not. We don't share the information with LHDN. Um, like what Job say, there are exceptions, of course. Like let's say there's a court order that says that X Y Z is involved in a drug trafficking case, and we need access to his trading records. Then, because the letter comes from the court, then we would be, I guess, in this situation, we be we be compelled to do it. But I mean, if people are, are trading normally, they, they shouldn't have to worry about that. We, we have to follow PDPA as well. And you can't just simply share people's information like that across government agencies like that just because somebody asked for it. So yeah, we will do everything we can to protect privacy. Yep. And QY? Okay. All right, you should be good. You should be good. Yep, I think. Uh, sorry, I think uh, the sound was mute. Me too. Um, pretty much is a is is a, uh, same like you know, but Luno and students uh, try to share. Uh, we we pretty much have the same stance. We value a lot on PDPA, and it's not like what the public think. Uh, you know, uh, the information we will anyhow share to the relevant uh, agency, right? Yes. Um, I think just to sidetrack a bit. Um, some educator or the crypto community they even share that don't trade in the regulated exchanges, um, um, you know, because you are constantly being monitored. I, I think that's just a misconception. Um, they, 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 it's, it's not really like what they uh, imagine uh, that way. Uh, it's much safer and secure because we are under governance. There's governance in place. So yeah, that's that's that's, um, that's the point I want to highlight. Yeah. Right. Um, I don't know if that answer is going right. to satisfy. Um, I don't know if that answer is going to satisfy. Uh, yeah, I don't know if it's going to satisfy all the sort of um, hardcore um, cy cypherpunks, but um, it is what it is. Uh, and the next question also from a uh, uh, meetup member, uh, Amirul asks, uh, what's the tax situation like for trading crypto? Uh, maybe Job, if you, if you know, you can, uh, you can share. At the moment, uh, I think uh, what do we fall under capital gains? Uh, it's not really a thing right now for crypto, right? So this is this is. Hang 
currently, if it's under capital gains, if you declare your, your profits, then yes, but uh, uh, there's no like trading uh, profit uh, taxes or anything like that that exists. Okay, and uh, Aaron and uh, QI, feel free to chip in. If we go with the, if we go with the, the if we go with the typical um, LHDN guidance, again, this is from this is common practice by LHDN. Uh, I don't think they've been very clear about uh, crypto gains, but if we look at other capital gains like stock market gains or things like that, they are not usually they are not taxable. Like they are not they are not taxable. But if we are talking about you know you are using you're doing it as an, a source of income. Uh, that whatever that you know if you do it as a source of income, whatever that activity is, uh, you should probably declare it and pay your taxes lah. I, that, that's a good point. If it's for salary, then yes, it's it's taxed. Yeah, for example. Yeah. For example. Yeah, I think uh, my I think, uh, of course I'm not the best spokesperson of this, but um, I have the same understanding with what Aaron just shared. Um, crypto is you know, typically tax free uh, on the revenue or the income that you earn from the investment. But if you are doing this like day trading, like become a your full time job. Or your as a, your secondary income where you're always in out in out of the market, you know, trading. Then I think you have to declare uh, on income as an income tax. Yeah. Yeah, I, I keep my records just in case. <laughs> yeah. Um. Okay. So um. So another question from the uh, meetup members uh, is that uh, uh the crypto industry as it is right now uh, is very small uh, and it faces a lot of uh, challenges with um, education and preventing miseducation. Um, and, as, and I want to add this in, um, since all three of you are relatively new, uh, are there any plans to do any joint initiatives to sort of educate the market more on how cryptocurrency is useful and how Malaysians can uh, benefit from it? Uh, maybe Aaron, you wanna start? Yep, definitely. So we've, I think there's the online part of it and there's the offline part of it. The online part is things like webinars, uh, website, blog, YouTube, channel. I think all of this we've been doing for a long time. Um, the offline part of it is the one that we wanted to put more effort this year, sort of uh, roadshows, face-to-face -face engagement, but Obviously, due to COVID-19, we have not been able to do much. Um, so I think the, the strategy will, will fall back to, to online. Um, yeah, I think we, we, there have been also talks actually between the three digital asset exchanges ourselves, uh, maybe to do some joint uh, education talks so it's not seen as biased or you know, one-sided. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to announce more of those kind of stuff soon. But yeah, it's, it's going to be online mostly moving forward. All right, and uh, QI? Yeah. yeah, definitely we are very excited. I, I believe, yeah, I think Aaron just shared um, on, uh, on the SIDC uh, side. Um, where I think soon I look into celebrity to create awareness. And I definitely this initiative won't be you know, just one or two month thing. I think uh, we will go to the three years plan to see how we can create this awareness and you know up uplift the whole community uh, understanding and you know, also the misconceptions. I think the people still can not get you know Bitcoin investment uh, and, uh, you know and money game because some game also be very sophisticated. They also can talk blockchain you know, as good as it is. It's just that they they change the direction to more scale. So. Um, a lot of things are bad, so we yeah, are really looking forward to what just to see how we can do it. Yeah, so he men um, uh, uh, mentioned, the, uh, Chi mentioned the important point, which is money games, right? And uh, we're from Penang, so we know all about money games and, and how the market here is, is very big on it. So, you know, um, Right now, the understanding is here. The where education needs to be is up here, and everything in between is where all these money games lie. 
and uh, really uh, education is forefront for us as well. Um, yes, we've been in talks. We'll, we'll, we'll wait to uh, talk more about it once uh, the details are end out. But uh, other than that, any chance of reaching out to the greater masses and teaching people about how crypto works and how, you know, how to avoid scams, that's a big part of uh, what we want to do. And we're always happy to, to be invited to speak um, you know, at events uh, to help uh, share the word. It's very, uh, and personally, it's a, it's a big part of why I'm in this space uh, personally as well. Yeah, and I'm uh, I'm sure all the communities that are involved, uh, even within this call, would be I would love to work with you, with you guys as well. Um, and on that note, because uh, of the troubles with regulations that Malaysians have faced, uh, I'm sure you know as well that uh, a bunch of Malaysians have uh, moved to trading, say on uh, OTC markets or um, maybe international exchanges like Binance. Um, so. What are your strategies to try and reclaim that uh, that market for yourselves? Maybe Joe? So, um, first up, the user experience is, is always much better than a centralized exchange, right? Uh, we've traded on P2P before and it is quite uh, laborious and also prone to uh, uh, scams as well. Uh, man in the middle comes to mind, things like that. Um, and of course, uh, I think uh, markets will, will tend to understand that over time, you, you'd see things that regulated exchange has, uh, exchanges have, such as the uh, safety nets to avoid, uh, sorry, safety nets to avoid things like pump and dumps and wash trading. These are things that are required for us to, to put into our system to improve customer protection. We have circuit breakers uh, and things like that that are, uh, you know, um, must be in place. Uh, which just make sure that, that customers uh, can trade in a safer space. On top of that, we have to uh, assign regulated trustees to appoint uh, and oversight our client assets uh, to avoid misappropriation of funds. So, you know, um, a lot of these things are innate. It's not an active strategy to go and uh, pull things out of the P2P exchanges, but uh, people will uh, see the difference and uh, understand what it is, right, when they put themselves at risk on an unregulated platform versus a regulated platform. Um, on the topic of international exchanges and OTCs, that one's a, a hit and miss, right? That there is benefits uh, for them to, to be trading on those exchanges because uh, it's, it's a welcome activity in our domain. Traders pay attention to the spreads between these exchanges and our local exchanges and uh, are welcome to arbitrage these markets. And you know, it, it generates uh, liquidity between us and the international market. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. And maybe Aaron? Yep. I think additionally, yeah, Joe put those points so excellent. So like, not <laughs> like he, he took the words out of my mouth, right? But um, I think just additionally, I think we, we don't necessarily have to compete head on, right? Like how do you compete with Binance? Because number one, Binance is unregulated. Uh, number two, they list like, I don't know, hundreds if not thousands of coins. And that's never going to happen in a regulated exchange, right? Because even the coins that we list, we actually have to discuss it with the SE to get approval. So it's really a matter of seeing how we can offer the best user experience. Uh, again, it's trade-offs, right? I think as customers, uh, if you are a, a sort of, a, I guess, a discerning customer, you will realize that when you go to an international or unregulated exchange, you're taking a lot more risk for whatever benefits that you're getting. So whereas we want to offer something that is safe, regulated, something local, um, and I think we might lose some of the, the maybe the high-end customers to these international exchanges, but for the majority of Malaysians, they will probably want to trade on a local regulated exchange. So as long as we give them the best uh, local service, um, I think that will be the, the winning strategy. Thank you, Wayne. Yeah, I think pretty much, uh, you know, Joe and also has a very good point there. I just want to highlight, you know, the beauty of uh, regulated exchanges. Um, to be honest, three of us go through a lot of hustle and it's definitely not an easy job to, 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 to get a and not get to business. I want to share, you know, trustee for, for even on the, the bank that you get your ringgit 
and also digital asset, we have to find a reputable uh, partner so, and ensure the key is, you know, key not just by the management of the company, but we have an independent trustee. Uh, on top of that, you know, we also put compliance at, at the foremost, right? Uh, the idea is to give you a safe environment to trade. If you are looking for B2B kind of platform or unregulated exchanges of the platform, right? The, the idea is you don't know who you trade with, right? Um, you might be a good person. You are you don't have the intention to do any bad sort of things, but you don't know, you know, you deal with your counterparty, where is their source of money, right? You are exposing the risk um, into getting into a problematic situation where, you know, it's not necessary. So I think that that's the key idea, you know, when you still, you know, using this P2P, you have to always ask yourself, is it feasible for the long run? Is it safe enough? Um, do you know the platform, you know, uh, have, are, are they uh, liable for anything? Can they just close shop and, you know, and decide not to operate tomorrow, right? I think end of the day, I think these are the key questions investor really should ask themselves. Um, of course, if you are in the jurisdiction, they still not, uh, the regulator actually is still not available. Uh, you have no choice, right? But Malaysia now, you have a choice, right? Yeah, that's like. And uh, I think um, one of you mentioned earlier about the process for listing coins on your exchanges. Uh, would you be able to describe to us, the listeners, how that works? Is it uh, like you have to lobby together to talk to, talk to SC or one exchange suggests it or the community can uh, push for it? Um, would you be able to share how that works? Uh, maybe QY? Um, I think definitely like um, I think I believe one discussion we have with uh, Luno is because uh, back in Singapore we already we go for this this we we can be a you know joint initiative to to push this uh because now the SC let's say approve uh the the the, the fourth token or coins. Uh, definitely three of uh, the approved exchange can definitely list it and support it. So why not, you know, if, uh, if something that everyone has the same interest, uh, we definitely can work, 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 work on it together. I think that's the idea. But I will pass to Aaron yeah, to share further thoughts. Cool. So if we look at the SC's guidelines, it's uh, um, you need to submit, a, a, I guess, a paper to, and that explains multiple things. For example, explains uh, how decentralized is the coin, who is the founding team, uh, what, what is the technology behind the coin. There are many things that are described. So it's a bit like application for, for some, um, for like even like a mini version of application for our uh, exchange. Um, as to whether who can submit it, like can a member of the community submit it? Uh, I'm actually not sure. But definitely for, for exchanges, when we want to list a token, we have to submit it to the SC. La. I think it's possible to do it, like uh, Hong mentioned, it's possible to do it a joint submission. Or if you go separately also, I think the SC accepts submissions. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll check in here. So, yeah, I think uh, exactly what they said, right? Um, what uh, Aaron and uh, QI said, we, we can submit it individually. And uh, of course, if you have a single voice, it's obviously going to have a better uh, effect uh, with the SC. Um, you know, it's not like we're trying to pluck one out of the air. But outside of that, we also have to pay attention to the things like the demand, the tokenomics, before proposing um, uh, any coin to the SC. We also just don't want to propose any random coin up there that, you know, gets shut down or is tied into something that we are not, uh, that's not in line with our business practices, right? Yeah. So, and I think um, I'm just going to extend it out to, I think a lot of people keep asking about stable coins <laughs> when, it comes, when it comes to how do you list this and, uh, you know, come and list some stable coins with, uh, for Forest and, you know, put in USDT. But at the end of the day, um, number one is the SE's uh, prerogative, right, to, to uh, decide on it. And of course, when you're talking about things like stable coins, uh, you're entering into the foray of like Bank Nagara's area. You know, you, listing a USDT is not much different from using uh, listing a USD, and the USDT is not governed by the US Fed. So, you know, uh, you do you really want to play in that pool right now? 
Um, so yeah, I think a lot of questions come around uh, that, especially like stable coins and stuff. Uh, yeah, I think um, personally, I see, well, what I understand happens in OTC markets is people buy uh, stable coins more with Ringgit and then they go into um, uh, other cryptocurrencies. Um, and uh, maybe for the listeners, uh, if you have any coins you'd like to shill to the exchanges, you can put it in the chat and you can have a sense of uh, what the community likes. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> but related to that though, um, and, and with uh, helping uh, adoption for the regulated exchanges, uh, one idea that I've heard uh, being thrown around and I would personally love is if there is a dollar cost averaging method uh, to go into your exchanges. Uh, let's say I put in my credit card uh, once a month and then you just buy it for me automatically. Uh, I think that would be amazing. And um, yeah, I think Stablecoin would fit uh, that uh, idea very much. Uh, but have you thought about using, uh, creating features like allowing for uh, dollar cost averaging? Um, should I? Yeah, we can go with Joe. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I mean, it's in the roadmap. Yeah. So, so yeah. Yeah, it's definitely a feature that that you know adds uh, value to the community. Okay. Good yeah. to hear. <laughs> yeah, it's like hello goals thing, right? So yeah, uh, <laughs> cool. yeah. we want to do it, but it's in the roadmap. I mean, yeah, there's tons of stuff on the roadmap, so <laughs> to have to have to keep off one by one, right? Yeah, but it's there. Thank you, White. I'd, I'd like to hear about. Uh, sorry, sorry, yeah, about uh, asking the community to tell us what are the coins that they really like and uh, throw it up there. <laughs> you know, let's have a. Uh, informal survey of what's out there in the Malaysian market right now. All right, uh, sorry, uh, QI interrupted you, go ahead. Yeah, no worries, I'm mean, just saying that yeah, we, we have the same stand, uh, uh, all, all, all in our roadmap, and definitely it's a very key feature that a lot of investors are looking at, so yeah, hopefully can release this soon. All right, so we have uh, 10 minutes uh, before our speakers need to go. Uh, they've already spent um, longer than uh, earlier promised. Um, so before we go off, I think I'd like to shift it a bit towards DeFi and uh, what your thoughts uh, are on that. So especially since we mentioned stablecoin, uh, one very um, sort of unmissable stablecoin is the DAI. Uh, and, you know, even especially with that, you can even do things like um, uh, automatically link it out to your own wallet and then or put it into a DeFi platform. Um, but uh, to start, uh, what are your personal thoughts on DeFi and like have you used any of those uh, DeFi platforms uh, yourself? Uh, DeFi platforms yourself? Yeah, QI, maybe you can start. Maybe uh, I will start first. Yeah, but I mean, uh, it's a very complicated. Um, role right now as a coder definitely um, DeFi seems like you know as a crypto farm is the way to go but because I'm a bit for the DeFi community might not be happy to hear about this but um, we, we stand on the C5 not sure you guys heard about us but we yeah we, we, we should you know play what DeFi have by in a centralized uh, finance way um, but you still you know have a lot of beauty of uh, what blockchain have right it's just that at, at these junctures, um, if you see, I'm, I'm so sorry to play a, a bit of a backside of the DeFi is that there are a lot of incidents, there are a lot of bugs right now. And I'm not saying DeFi, actually I, I really see this is going to be a, be, a, be a thing in the future, but, but at least now, at this juncture, I think they still get that uh, the community feel, right? There are, there are a lot of risks. Uh, we are talking about monetary right now. Um, no matter the die, you know, they're also facing some bugs uh, at the platform. And basically, there are a lot of issues. There's a flash loan. Um, if, I mean, for technical people, they, they, they're aware of flash loan. There are a lot of exploitations, right? And we are not talking about a few thousand or hundred thousand. We're talking about millions. Um, at this juncture, I believe, you know, um, regulated exchanges, if they can play further up, level up their game into a centralized finance, um, we can do a pretty good job in the way that, you know, we are talking about insurance, we are talking about trust, we are talking about governance. So all these aspects, you know, um, give a bit of like a bridge that you can buy what, you know, DeFi can serve. At the same time, and maybe, you know, take this period of time as a transition phase 
uh, the DeFi, you know, when the platform on the DeFi are more stable. And I, I, I wish, you know, uh, also a bit pull down on the DeFi a bit, but I'm, I'm so, so sorry to say this, but uh, yeah, you know, G20 and others are coming out with fair travel rules and others. Um, DeFi will face a lot of challenging moments um, to push the, the, the channel ahead, right? Um, but taking a step back, there are a lot of things you should learn from DeFi. Um, I think it really enhances uh, on the liquidity and it really, you know, um, shape the ecosystem thing further, right? As, uh, aside of just speculation, what else, you know, what utility cases, what financing things that you can do can, uh, next. I think that's a very impressive thing uh, to ponder about. Hey, Aaron? I think DeFi is the definitely gonna be a, a something uh, major and continue to grow. It's already something major, but I think it's only gonna continue to grow. I think as much as we talk about the decentralized world, the decentralized world will learn from the centralized world, right? Finance is there's a lot going on in lending and things like that that decentralized finance will will pick up and learn along the way. Um, as to whether we are going to be looking at introducing these features. Um, definitely, we're already thinking about it. But as what Hong has mentioned, uh, I think there's so many considerations, right? Um, again, we are regulated, so it's not a simple matter of us saying, yes, let's, let's introduce DAI tomorrow, right? We need to speak to the SC. We need to think about all the legal considerations. We need to think about all the uh, fairness considerations, transparency, you know, are the team behind the tokens, uh, reasonable are they do what's their reputation so again yeah it's one of those things that hopefully we can roll out it's on the roadmap but you know if we don't roll it out don't 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 quote me because maybe somewhere along the way we found a, a roadblock that we can't fix right now Joe? yeah well I think uh, my, my stand on DeFi is, uh, is a personal stand, right? I think that there is going, it, it is messy right now. A lot of people have lost a lot of money, but then there's still a lot of development in that space. And it's, it's kind of good to go and uh, get yourself burned at this stage because uh, whatever you learn now is going to be applied to whatever you have in the future. Uh, there are still going to be applications for decentralized finance. And I, I stand that there's going to be benefits only because DeFi, the basics of it, if I can, if I can picture it, is to remove friction from uh, centralized uh, financial systems, right? Uh, you, you're, if everything is uh, running on a blockchain or, or, or some form of a, a digital asset uh, management system, then things can transact smoothly with uh, minimum interference from intermediaries and things like that. So these, there, there is an opportunity to develop in this space. There, there is a lot of uh, potential uh, I would see. I may not you know, agree with all of the, the things like certain P2P lending methods and things like that that's being played with. Uh, you know, it's too scary, but I, I definitely see that innovation in this space will push the blockchain ecosystem in the future. Um, it just doesn't make sense uh, um, to not uh, have development in decentralized finance um, there may be some portions of it that are more riskier than others, but uh, I mean, if you consider things like uh, central banks coming on uh, with their own digital currencies in the future, this puts them on the same wavelength as uh, certain cryptocurrencies. It's not, I mean, I'm not shilling for central banks, uh, central bank coins, right? Uh, what I'm just saying is that they're essentially going to be a, a digital asset with uh, a centralized governing portion, but then, uh, you know, you can now interact with it um, almost frictionless. Uh, so there are financial services that can benefit from that. And, uh, you know, it's just going to need to see development, uh, more and more development in that space. So I think that the money going into DeFi is going to be very, uh, it, it is going to be bigger than what it is now. And it is already uh, big. Uh, just how big and uh, who's going to get burned along the way and how much people are going to lose money from mistakes. That's going to be interesting to watch, right? <laughs> so yeah yeah okay so we have a few minutes left i think uh, i'll have uh, just keep to two very short questions um since uh, job you mentioned uh, cbdc central bank digital currency uh, what mm -hmm. are your thoughts uh, all of you on cbdc um like two three lines max oh uh, yeah so yeah now if, if if it's three minutes it's not enough <laughs> i have a lot to say about cbdc <laughs> but essentially um 
it's not i'm surprised it took this long for certain countries to announce uh, you know it's not an if but when i'm not saying it's good or bad but it's going to exist just because um digital assets are going to be a benefit uh to trading digitally with uh, fiat uh, traditional fiat you know, there's, there's advantages to going uh, to building a transaction validation into the transaction rather than the, the actual uh, notes being issued. So that speeds up things in the future and a lot of adoption can be built around it and it can interact with, uh, you know, whatever else we're building in the blockchain space. So more of a, a when rather than an if right now. Uh, I think it's coming and uh, we'll have to, you know, work around it, whether you like it or not, right? Uh, depends on which side of the field you're at. Uh, any whispers on a Malaysian uh, on a ringgit uh, coin? <laughs> <laughs> you can say no I, comment. Uh, BNM territory, man. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> you know, you know how the the room complete. Everyone starts smiling whenever you talk anything about like central bank or bank negara or US. Everyone's just like, oh, <laughs> it's like, um, I, yeah, it's it's tough, right? It's, yeah, it's, it's hard. <laughs> oh yeah, uh, thoughts on CBDC. Oh yeah, uh, the you, thoughts Aaron. on CBDC from you, Aaron. Um, I'm gonna take just the two three lines. Uh, inevitable, but I suspect it's gonna take some time to improve and perfect because it seems like a really cool, easy idea, but implementation is gonna be the tough one. Mm -hmm. Uh, QA. Should, should I start? Uh, QA. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I uh, concur with uh, Aaron. I mean, uh, okay, we think this is the trend that uh, um, we see be arriving soon. I mean, it's here already. So a few banks uh, in China already start distributing. Um, I think it will shift, you know, shape the whole financial landscape. You know, ECB, I heard they are also doing the similar thing. I'm not sure Bank of Japan are going to do the same or not. A lot of central banks, I believe, may be wrong. Uh, I'm, I'm not keen to move forward with this technology. The rest of them are actually already. It's a lot of them you know, when they want to distribute and, and, and launch this. And when that happens, and as a South Asia country, we really have to think how you know, the trade, you know, how the supply chain, how our, our trading, the traditions, you know, sovereign. How, how is it going to work next, right? Um, if by sticking on the previous one and without, you know, advancing to the next phase, I think we will have the risk, you know, to, to, to have a gap, you know, when we come to trade of the party, like, you know. Um, so, I, I think it's unavoidable moving to the, you know, that I bring it back. But whether is it, you know, um, Ben Agra will be the, the key players that bring this initiative or with more like, you know, regular exchanges like us to push this, you know, I, I think it still lies who is going to be the primary issuance of the, of the stable coin right for, for Ringgit and uh, who is going to take the lead to, to clear the regulations at the end of the day. I don't think technology side, you know, uh, there's any issue on that. It's pretty much very ready. Um, but on the regulation side, the compliance side, you know, who, you know, how can we break through this? And um, you know, when our market is still pretty much you know, not familiar with digital asset like Bitcoin, uh, how we can move to the next phase? I think this is question to ponder. Okay, so uh, this last question, uh, very quickly from uh, each of you, uh, since you have well some of the community here, uh, what would be your message uh, if you're talking to them directly on um, just a message for them and how they can help you um, advance cryptocurrency uh, in Malaysia? We'll go with uh, Job, Aaron, QI. All right. Uh, well, come and trade with us. We give rebates. <laughs> plug, plug, plugs aside, plugs aside I, I would tell the average Joe that, um, you know, do your own homework. There's a lot of scams in the crypto, uh, under the guise of crypto. Don't just follow people blindly into the space. Do your homework and make sure you don't get hurt. Avoid, uh, invest only what you can afford to lose. Uh, I'm going to pick the security angle. Uh, we know, right, in the crypto community, there's been uh, cases where people have had 
SMS hijacked. We know we hear of people's telegram getting compromised. Please, please, please take the, the, the extra time to go and secure all your accounts. Whether it's Facebook, email, every single account to FA it. Um, and yeah, tell all your friends and family to do the same because yeah, there's a lot of attacks going on. Yeah, I think I'll end this with uh, tokenless. We have promo code with you all. I just message at the Zoom group chat. <laughs> so please feel free to register if you haven't. Uh, if you have registered, let us know if you, uh, you know, you, you miss out the promo code or something. Yeah, we can, we can see how we can help on. Um, yeah, just, just look forward for you all to join any of our webinar. We always can stay in touch. We have Telegram, we have all, all kinds of software. So met on social media. So just feel free to follow us and we look forward to, to sharing soon. All right. So um, thanks everyone. Uh, thank you all the speakers for us uh, uh, taking your time, especially extending another half an hour. Um, thanks uh, Ecoscan for sponsoring uh, IFKL and all the communities, uh, Bitcoin Malaysia, uh, Access Malaysia, G1 Group um, and FinTech Association Malaysia. And lastly, everyone else for uh, listening in as well and uh, bearing with us through the technical issues. Um, yeah, so QI already said that uh, Tokenize is giving a free promo code uh, worth 15 ringgit, uh, Tokenize ETH. And um, if nothing else, I will um, kind of just uh, end it with uh, giving a shout out to our community member, Jason Vandal, who is uh, setting up DAO Records. Uh, whose mission is to reinvent the record label. So um, all of you feel free to uh, step out of the meeting. I am just going to play his song on YouTube uh, before I end the meeting uh, on my end. So yes, thank you everyone. And, thanks, every uh, thanks everybody. It's been, it's been fun. Thank you guys. Happy halving. Happy halving. Happy halving. <laughs> Thanks, thanks, guys. Thanks. me the shock. I rock like hopscotch. Find me in the lab cooking daps more dapper than Dan. My bull traps no flash in the van. Ask me to ship a cheap bucket. The eager to ship till they bear witness. The streets buzzing. Chart topper. I put a cap in the market. Speculate, but you'll never hit the target. I'm more ways in four days with tone vase. I don't play like ghost face with no rage. This is not financial advice, but you better toss a coin to your man and be nice. Hey, I stick around, I don't roll magic dice. I exit the grounds, running when I strategize. I short rappers in the future, there's no CME. I bleed BTC, plus the key to C. So when I found out, I had to bring the label back. Build that stack, I got it planned out. This one's for the kick coin grant. So now I'm calling all my whales where the big boys at. See, I took this track, minted it as an NFT, and swapped in that campaign using EAT. I said I'm free, the opposite is centralized. I paid my dues, quit talking, better recognize three years back. I would have called this my white paper. I'm still here, about to drop a hype fader. Hip hop the blockchain, that was my lifesaver. I don't need a black to record the flight data to the moon no fomo i'll be home soon but for now hit a promo and emanate the tune i don't hide behind words this rap is open source but if you use it in your whack i choose no remorse my brute force is more than you can handle red like the wick on your one day candle led by that sick rapper man named vandalized red by a stick had to plan and claim samples i got baggage some of which are shit coins i won't drop names i'm careful with my fist points, I would drop fame. I don't ever want to disappoint. I want gains, let, let me leverage off of this joint. Right. Uh, thanks, guys. Thanks for your time. Uh, we will see you again at the uh, next meetup. Bye.